All right. Anyway, it's good to be back. Uh, I hope everyone enjoyed their feast. And, and with the emphasis and concentration on the feast, if you weren't traveling, if you weren't elsewhere, then you were still paying attention to all the presentations that you may have had uh, exposure to. And there were a lot of presentations. There were a lot of uh, speakers to listen to during the week. And from that kind of journey in traveling, the journey in the, on the internet, just li listening to the, the different messages that many of us were exposed to, as I mentioned, it could be rather taxing, depending on how you look at it. It could be taxing, it could be rewarding. It could be taxing in preparing for the feast and preparing to travel and, and trying to get online to figure out how to download whatever app or sign on to whatever web page or whatever Zoom link to try to watch whatever speaker you're trying to watch. It could be taxing during the feast, trying to make things right, trying to get things together. And it could be taxing afterwards when it's time to come home, deal with the arrangements, and you return a rental car for them to tell you it's twice as much as they told you it was when you took it. Or it could be rewarding. All of these things are things we can relate to after coming back. And all of these things are part and parcel with going on a journey. And so having done that, now's a good time to, to be able to recognize and relate to many of the journeys that we do see in the Bible. And there are a lot of them. There are a lot of journeys there. And I figured it would be an optimum time to highlight some of those journeys, some of those narratives. And immediately when you open your Bible, you already present it with a journey on page one. It starts as soon as you open it. And from the beginning of that Bible to the end, we're being witness to a number of journeys. And having come back from the feast, having come back from having our attention fixated on a laptop or computer screen, or having earbuds in our ear so we can listen to all those different messages, we can now be able to relate to some of these journeys, some of these hardships or joys that come from traveling and moving about and trying to hear something good. Genesis 1, chapter 14. Not even that. Even if you start in the very first line. You start in the very first line, and we find in the beginning God is doing something. He, he's, he's making adjustments. He's customizing. And he's creating order to a world that is out of order. And, and this process is symbolically picturing the journey that all mankind would find itself on in pursuing God. And one, having been separated from God, and two, trying to make their way back. You ever been on the highway and you're trying to get somewhere? And as you're, as you're traveling, you miss your turn, you miss your stop, you miss your exit. And at that point, it becomes a trek just trying to get back. Because the highway may not allow you to turn around. And so you're going to go forward hoping you're going to get off at the next exit. But the highway guards aren't going to give you another exit. That highway is going to go on forever. And if you do encounter a next exit, it isn't an exit onto the street. It's an exit onto another highway. And so as you make all these twists and turns, you find it even harder just trying to get back to where you were. And many times this is, can be one of the journeys that man has found himself on, in trying to find God. And when we look out in the public today, people are trying to find God, but they don't have a clue what they're looking for. They're not <laughs> sure if God wears sneakers or shoes, if he wears slacks or jeans if his hair is long or short, if he has a Caesar or if he got the taper on the side. Is his hair processed or natural? People can't figure it out. Is God a man or a woman? And what's his name? 
Does it have five letters or four? Does it have three? Who, who is God? Is he Allah? Is he Jah? Is he the most high? And there's all this confusion. So that's the point. Man is on a journey. That's one of the journeys that we find in this Bible. That's one of the journeys that we'll find in just living life. Yes. Nevertheless, continuing on. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep and the spirit of God was hovering over the waters. We find the condition where man, where the elements are reflecting man's detachment from God. Now this word was can just as well be translated became. And so something happened that created an environment where things weren't working right. And so this refurbishing process could easily be a sim symbolic menu of man's pathway back to God. And so we, we have seven days. And within those seven days, God took certain steps that would create an environment that would be conducive to life. The steps that he took weren't wrapped up within one day, given this, the, the, the outline that we're reading. And so we see the first thing that God did was that he created light. That was the most important issue. That was the biggest problem. That's what needed to be fixed first, was the light. Man is, is caught up in this darkness and cannot find God, doesn't know who God is. You ever come home from a long day, as soon as you walk in the door, you're affected by a number of elements and you have to figure out which one is pulling at you the most. Are you the most hungry? And then you're gonna go eat first. Do you have to go to the bathroom and you're gonna run there first? Or are you sleepy and you're gonna forgo the first two and just go to bed? Depending on which is the strongest, it's the one that you'll yield to. But here, there were so many problems and so many issues. And the first thing that was created was light. That's what was most necessary to create God's presence, to make it so that man at some point would be able to recognize that he needed God. He could, could have just as well created an antelope. And that antelope would have been walking around in the smog, in the dark. But what good would that have done? What does that accomplish? And so he made light and he separated the darkness from the light. And as you continue on, he separates the waters. And now you have this separation of a body of substance or element. And, and that can mean a number of things. It could refer to populace, it could refer to people. It could refer to people that are enlightened and people that are unenlightened. Again, I'm not going to go through that whole list of symbolism, but you see these steps that God is pointing out are needed for man to be reconnected with him. And it's not just the symbolism of the environment. We also have a, another outlook of just the week. And here we are on Saturday again, looking forward to this moment of rest, to this kingdom that God would bring, where man would be reconnected with God. Sometimes during the work week, you get to Wednesday and they call it hump day. You're already excited that the week's almost over, that you're gonna get a break if you don't work on the weekends. So, however our week may go, we always find ourselves looking forward to when we're going to get that break. Some people get their schedule at work and they automatically start looking for the next holiday. It could be a month away. I already had that experience last week. Apparently, I'm off on Friday in two weeks. I have no idea what the holiday is. But my point is, people are looking forward to this day of rest and they don't even realize they're looking forward to it. 
They want God and don't even know they want it. When you look at the stories of the sailors and explorers that went out trying to find new routes to the new world, many of them would get sick and they would come down with scurvy. And the doctors of the time had no idea what was wrong and how to cure it and what was the issue. So those sailors, well, they made sure they had rum on the boat. But the fruit, throw that overboard. Especially if the, the, the weather gets bad, we don't need the fruit, it's only weighing down the boat. And in actuality, that was the cure to the diseases that were afflicting them when they would go out. It was vitamin C, it was anything citrus, and that's exactly what they threw away. And they needed a cure bad. They wanted to come home to their wives and their children, and they wouldn't. And little did they know, the cure was something that they did not value. And the things that they valued, the Jack Daniels, it didn't have the power they thought it had. Again, another example of a journey that we all go on through our lives. But where I was going to start was Genesis 1, chapter, four, uh, chapter 1, verse 14. And God said, let there be lights in the vault of the sky to separate the day from the night, and let them serve as signs to mark sacred times and days and years, and let them be lights in the vault of the sky to give light on the earth. Many translations skip over what I just read. These lights, the moon, the sun, and stars, they're, they're, they're more than just objects to input into a love song. They were meant and put there for sacred times, times that, that had relevance. The holy days, times where man was going to have to recognize, let me take time to pause and recognize that this is something important. And we just went through an annual rotation and cycle of holy days. And those holy days, they picture the quest that every man and woman is on, the quest to find God, the quest to get back to God after having been separated from God. And that's one of the greatest journeys that we can find ourselves in. And, and we recognize it every year, but the world doesn't. The world doesn't understand. They don't understand the meanings that are behind it. When we got back to the feast, I was coming home from being out. It was late, it was after 10 o'clock, and I'm passing a party hall. But this party hall caters to, uh, to those that are, are Jewish. And so out of the party hall were coming a number of people. And I was on my phone as I stood on the corner and these party goers are coming out and they were older. And then, you know, the men were wearing yarmulkes. I'm trying to get my order right for Domino's. As I'm standing there on the phone and this man strikes a conversation with me that I'm sure at any other point in time he would not have tried to talk to me. And I was wearing one of those bubble coats that you see a lot of the young men wear. And I had on a, a black knit hat, but it wasn't even all the way down. It was tipped to the side. My point is I was looking very urban. And this man struck up a conversation with me and the women in his party were looking at me like, like why, is, why are they talking to each other? Well, he was drunk. He was nice. He wasn't, he wasn't smashed, but he decided to tell me how much of a good time he had. And how he said there was food and there was a lot of vodka and we were drinking. And I'm listening, I'm going, all right, that's a beautiful thing. You know? And then he said, you know, we were celebrating the Jewish holidays. And then he went, do you know them? And I said, yeah, these are tabernacles. And he was like, what? How does brother, how do you know that? And that ended the conversation. He just went like, all right. And, and he just kept on. That knowledge one day will encompass the whole world and people 
will understand that's the pathway to understand the pathway to happiness the pathway to God and here this man has exposure to it to some degree in conjunction with vodka and it has no more meaning than that and so we may very well have been on two different journeys I and my route to get some Domino's pizza and utilize the 6.99 coupon for some chicken wings and a flatbread pizza. And this fellow coming home from a party, drinking and eating. And yet we were on completely different paths, completely different journeys. And so that's one journey that we constantly are recognizing each year. And we'll begin to recognize this journey again next year. Another journey that stands out, and it becomes even more prominent, is when we find Adam and Eve evicted, not just from the garden, not just from uh, a manic manicured landscape. They were being evicted from God, evicted from knowing and understanding God. You ever traveling somewhere and your GPS is telling you where to go and your phone does? Now you don't know where to go. Now you don't have a clue. And that's what happened to mankind at that point when they got put out. There's no more GPS. You have no idea what to do. And you probably didn't study what the GPS was telling you to do in 1.4 miles. So now you're lost. And that's what the world finds itself in being lost. Genesis chapter 3, verse 22. And the Lord God said, The man has now become like one of us, knowing good and evil. He must not be allowed to reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. Meaning, he already made his choice. He chose to be exposed to life through trial and error. And that's the way he was going to learn and understand. And so 6,000 years would go by. 6,000 years in actuality may not be a long time to God. It's like, why would God postpone this? It's not that long to him. And when you really think about it, it isn't that long to us. Our lifespans are rather short within that 6,000 years. It sure does seem like a long time, though. And it seems like it's taken forever. And there are days where you want it to stop. And then there are other days where you want to see the next iteration of that superhero movie, and maybe, maybe you don't want it to stop until next summer. But nevertheless, we, we've been on this journey, and, and this journey began at that point in time. Another journey we could see is with Abram, who later became known as Abraham. Genesis chapter 12. In verse 1, the Lord had said to Abram, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Now, a lot of people focus on all those blessings. But if somebody told you, that today's the last day in your apartment, in your house. You got to go somewhere else. Figure it out later. But wherever you go, it's going to work out. You're going to get something good. You're not trying to hear all that. And who's to say that Abraham, did he have a hard time getting past the first sentence? Leave your country, your house, your people. I got to what? This may have been very challenging. At the point in time, Abraham or Abram was told this, his father had just passed, which now opened up the possibility of him exploring other options. He had been committed to his family prior, but once the patriarch passed away, you're now able to move on in, in their culture. And that's what happened. So now he's being told to go on a journey, to go elsewhere, find a new life, get a new job, 
We read stories about people like that. They just quit their job and up and move and go somewhere else to make a new life. No plans. Some people either look at them as being crazy or a genius, depending on how it works out. If you wind up living in a gutter, well, you were just straight crazy. But if you wound up living in an mansion afterwards, well, you're a genius. And the world is full of geniuses and crazy people. Again, all these different journeys. Abraham was instructed to go on a journey related to his faith in God, related to his relationship with God. And it probably was no easy feat. Many of you went on a journey to death just to get here. For whatever reason, something motivated you. I want to hear what this brother got to say. You may not have known which brother was going to stand up to talk, but you came to hear something. For whatever reason, we are all looking for God. And so you went on a journey. You put gas in your car. You put on some kicks or some shoes, or you brought a Metro card, and you did whatever you had to do to find yourself in this position, all in the name of trying to find God. You, too, went on a journey. Other people went on a journey. They're at the movies right now. The Rock got a new movie out. That's their path. That's their journey. That's their interest. But today, during this moment, during this time, on this Sabbath, that pictures God's 7,000-year plan, here we are on this journey. And like Abraham, we've been told to change our lives, the way we think, the way we live, and our pursuits in search of God, hoping, man, I hope this work out. I hope I'm on the right side of things. I hope God is recognizing what I'm doing. I hope I'm worshiping the right God and I'm true. This is the journey that we're all on. And, and, and then the blessings that follow and what are being spoken of to Abraham or Abram are blessings that recognize how his decisions to go on that journey, to follow God, would later down the line benefit all peoples but not just in a literal physical context, but in a spiritual context, because that's what the real journey is about. It's a spiritual journey. It's not a physical journey. It's, it, it involves spiritual insight. In Hebrews chapter 11, Hebrews 11 and verse eight, here we find, by faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as, in, as his inheritance, obeyed and went. Even though he did not know where he was going, by faith he made his home in the promised land. Like a stranger in a foreign country, he lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were here with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations whose architect and builder is God. Abraham did not know where he was going. He didn't have an insurance policy, but he was looking forward to something better. He was looking forward to a relationship with God that would, come, would become more evident. And that's basically what we're doing here today. On a, on a similar journey, just as Abraham. Abraham's descendants also would go on another noteworthy journey that stands out in the Bible. In Genesis 15, we find a revelation that was given to Abraham by God. As the sun was setting, Abraham fell into a deep sleep and a thick and dreadful darkness came over him. Then the Lord said to him, Know for certain that for 400 years your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own, and that they will be enslaved and mistreated there. This translation improperly implies that the Israelites were in Egypt for 400 years, 
That's not what this is saying. This is saying that in 400 years from the moment that Abraham is receiving this information, his descendants would be going to the promised land. They'd be returning there after having some degree of hardship and, and issues and enslavement. Verse 14, but I will punish the nation they serve as slaves, and afterward they will come out with great possessions. You, however, will go to your ancestors in peace and be buried at a good old age. In the fourth generation, your descendants will come back here, for the sin of the Amorites has not yet reached its full measure. So God is telling Abraham, four generations later, your kids, your descendants, they're going to come back to this space. They're going to go on a long journey, and they're going to arrive back here. A journey that pictured these people coming out of sin, leaving a way of understanding and living that deviated from the way God would have people live. Mr. Anderson spoke of that, and we spoke of Israel and Egypt. And we watched these people, and I've read about these people coming out of Egypt and going on this journey. We can see some other characteristics about that journey and characteristics that we ourselves would experience in our own journeys. In Exodus 13, Exodus 13 and verse 17, when Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them on the road through the Philistine country, though that was shorter. For God said if they face war, they might change their minds and return to Egypt. So God led the people around by the desert road toward the Red Sea. And here we find the Israelites on another journey where they went the long way on purpose. There was a shorter way. There was a quicker way. There was a simpler way. There was a more convenient way, but it wasn't the best way. And that's what happens on our journeys. And you would think if God is your Uber driver and you're in the back seat and you're like, yo, this dude don't know where he's going. You were supposed to turn right there. And instead he's going somewhere else. I've had these problems with Uber drivers. I'm like, my man, you're supposed to get on the highway right here. No, no, I'm not going to do that. But look, you're making me late. Get on the highway. Stop playing games. Yeah. And I hear the resonation is they're avoiding traffic. No, this fellow was straight being ignorant. He didn't know where he was going. But we can feel that way of God sometimes on our journey, that something's not right. There's got to be a better way, a shorter way, a more convenient way on this journey that we're on. And perhaps the Israelites felt the same, and they expressed it to their detriment. Deuteronomy chapter 8. Deuteronomy chapter 8. Deuteronomy is a, a book of, of speeches by Moses right before the Israelites crossed into the promised land. Moses was not going to be allowed to go with them. Deuteronomy is... It's a grouping of, of, of last words by Moses to the Israelites. Deuteronomy is the last call at the bar before the bar closes at 4.30 in the morning when you're at the club. You come get your drinks before everything shuts down. But remember how you were supposed to behave. Remember the good time you have in here at the club before you get your last drinks. Moses is telling them, remember everything you just went through. Some people will look at it as a grouping of three sermons by Moses, followed by some other poetry, some other songs of Moses. But this is what is being resonated. Moses is enforcing, remember what you need to know and understand. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 1, be careful to follow every command I am giving you today 
so that you may live and increase and may enter and possess the land the Lord promised on oath to your ancestors. Remember how the Lord, your God, led you all the way in the wilderness these 40 years to humble and test you in order to know what was in your heart. God here is admitting times were rough. You were humbled and tested, but it was for a purpose. We went the long way on purpose. We went over the bumpy roads on purpose. And it was so that you would come to a certain understanding. And we too would look at this and equate this journey that they were on with the journey that we're on in trying to find God. He humbled you, causing you to hunger and then feeding you with manna, which neither you nor your ancestors don't be ashamed, you know, come on, Nana. don't play those games, bring, no, bring that. <laughs> Gonna get all shy when you get to the first row. Don't do that. We're getting dry up here. No, but thank you. Remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the wilderness these 40 years to humble and test you in order to know what was in your heart, whether or not you would keep his commands. And a lot of times this is what we're being exposed to. Are we going to listen? If God just has us avoid every uncomfortable situation, would we change? You ever see those cars with the dummies in it? the crash dummies, and they crashed the car on purpose. Yeah. Can you imagine you the factory worker that put that together? Like, you're just gonna disregard all that hard work and crash the car on purpose? But it's done with an intent. It's done in the, 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 the vein of, of safety, that if they could see how the car responds to this degree of pressure, then they'll better understand what needs reinforcement in the future? And so you get tested. And so your car runs out of gas on the highway in the middle of the night. And so you lose your job. And so your marriage falls apart. And so your family members get sick. You can fill in the blank. Again, what kind of protocol is this? But these are the journeys that we're on. This is the journey that this nation was on and here we are in a similar circumstance. He humbled you, causing you to hunger and then feeding you with manna, which neither you nor your ancestors had known, to teach you that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. So now you're exposed to trouble, you're exposed to problems, you're exposed to difficulties on this journey and you're supposed to cling even more to God, many times people pull away from God when things get hard like that. If God doesn't add that cherry on the top, then I'm not going to play this game. If the cherry on the top is not there, then ice cream just is not worth eating. And they give up, and then they stop. What's the point of this then? But that's not the way we're supposed to be living. We're actually supposed to cling closer to God. And many times we see these difficulties in first world problems. We have first world problems. And things don't go right. Well, uh, we don't want to play this game. They're going to take the Disney Channel out of your cable package? ESPN? Really? And these are our problems. We go to a fast food restaurant and it takes too long to get our food. First world problems. And then this is the way that we think. But when you look at other people that don't have first world problems, when they have problems, what do they do? They cling to God. In our first world, when something goes wrong and the building collapses, you know, yeah, there's some sadness. But there's a light, this attitude, where was God? Some will go, God doesn't exist. 
And that's why this happened. People may suggest we should pray, and you will have a number of people go, don't waste your time. Don't pray. Just build better buildings. But when you look at other countries, when that building crashes, what do they do? They cry to God. They respond in more appropriate ways than the way we would. Because of our abundance, it impacts our ability to recognize God the way that we should sometimes. And here God is telling these people that he let out into problems, into trouble, that they were supposed to cling to him. And he wanted to see if they actually would do that, if they would rely on the manna that they didn't know, that didn't make sense, that they couldn't understand, and did not have exposure to prior. And that's, again, another journey that we find mankind is on. They don't know anything about manna, not God's manna. And that's something that we would come to understand today. And many of us are not from the Jewish culture. And during the, the days of unleavened bread, let you take out some unleavened bread while you're at work and someone sees you. Even if you're not trying to be all out in the street with it. You're like, what is that? It's it, inevitably, you, you get, what is that? You come to work looking busted. You're like, what are you wearing? But you break out something that doesn't make any sense that you're eating, and you get the same question. What is, what is that? It's flat. No concept that it's bread unless they're aware of what a matzah is. And they really don't know. And so you're eating it because it has meaning. It has value. It, it has a, an impression in your mind that you're trying to ingest. And to them, it's some strange, odd thing. And again, the differentiation between the two paths that we're on in this journey that we're living. Exodus chapter 4, verse 22. Exodus 4 and verse 22. The Lord said to Moses, when you return to Egypt, see that you perform before Pharaoh all the wonders I've given you the power to do. But I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. Then say to Pharaoh, this is what the Lord says. Israel is my firstborn son. And I told you, let my son go so that he may worship me. This is what God is requesting and asking of us for us to return to worship him to embark on that journey. This is what God wanted of Israel. God called Israel his son, and he instructed Pharaoh, that's my son, that's my child. These are my people, let them go, come worship me. You're not gonna get that version when you watch the movie. You're not gonna hear anything about Israel is my son. Let my son go. Yul Brenner isn't giving you that. Charlton Heston isn't gonna give you that. The CGI in the movies, it, it won't give you that. And you're going to get some other dosied up interpretation and the importance flies right over your head. And most people in popular Christianity and popular cinema appreciation would not be able to cite that line that way. They know let my people go, but they don't know let my son go. And that's how God saw Israel. And that's how God sees us. And we are children of God. And this is a journey that God wants us to embark on, to relate to him as we go on this journey. Hosea, chapter 11. Hosea 11 and verse 1. When Israel was a child, I loved him. And out of Egypt, I called my son. But the more they were called, the more they went away from me. They didn't listen. And that's a journey that we're not to emulate. No, our goal is to emulate Christ. To emulate how Christ lived, how Christ interacted with God the Father. How Christ viewed God the Father. How, how he thought. How he rationalized. That's the other journey that we're on. 
We see the journey that all mankind is on, that it's embodied in the creation week. We see the journey that all mankind is on, that is embodied in the, the holy days that we just went through, that shows how man has been separated and re-engaged with God, and how all humanity will be brought in to having a relationship with God. We see the journey that Abram went on, and how his behavior in the future will affect all mankind, and all mankind will benefit from what he did, from the relationship that he had with God. And it's not just about real estate in Israel and getting some choice pieces of land at a, a prime rate, a low interest rate. No, it's a spiritual, there's a spiritual context to it. It's a spiritual relationship. It's a spiritual endeavor that this journey is about. The journey that Israel was on was a journey that they could not fully bring to fruition the way it needed to be traveled. And we see that we too are to learn a lot from Israel in the way they came out of Egypt in that journey. They, they came out of sin. They came out of a culture that did not appreciate God. But you could take the people out the country and you can't take the country out the people. Yes. They're still going to act up. They're not going to behave any better. And that's what we struggle with in our journey, going back to the old way of doing things, the old way of handling things, dealing with stress, the old way of relating and wanting to go back to our old gods, the ones that we thought could help us. That doesn't work. It won't work. This is a journey that we just finished breaking down through the Feast of Tabernacles, where we're enlightening ourselves that there is no other way. And so we now become God's child. We now become God's children, spiritual Israel. And Israel themselves, they were God's children. They were God's son. They didn't follow through the way they should have in a spiritual manner. So we're not going to emulate that. We're going to emulate the way Christ behaved and the relationship that he had with God. So we're going to emulate God's true son, not Israel, but the Son of God. Matthew chapter 2. Matthew chapter 2 and, and verse 13. When they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. So here we find Joseph is with Mary, and he's uh, they, they have the, uh, the young child, the baby Jesus, as many would call him at that point. And in this dream, it is communicated to Joseph, get up, he said, take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up, took the child, meaning Jesus, and his mother during the night and left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, out of Egypt, I called my son. But this time, it is in Israel. This time is Christ coming out of Egypt. Here we have a child that would grow into a man that would live without sin, having to go through that same process of coming out of Egypt, just like we do, just like Israel had to. And we find that he goes through all of these repetitions in his life where he repeats things that really he didn't have to repeat because he didn't have sin. So he came out of Egypt. He got baptized to repent of sins, but he never sinned. But he's going through the same process as an example for us. So we too come out of Egypt, being the true children of God. And that's another journey that we find ourselves pursuing and going on. Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2 and in verse 5. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, 
We're going to behave the way he behaved, think the way he was thinking, act the way he was acting, and we're going to come out of sin the same way that he did. Verse 6, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage, meaning during this process of understanding that there are going to be steps that God the Father and Christ would take to redeem mankind to them. It was understood that Christ would become a man and die for the sins of mankind. In so doing, Christ's attitude was like, hold up, this plan ain't working out right. I'm not trying to go out like that. I'm not trying to do that. I'm not trying to give all of this up. I'm not trying to step away from this and be exposed the way a, a, a man is. The, 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 this verse is saying he wasn't holding on to that. It wasn't his vanity or his pride that was saying, no, I'm, I'm God and I'm not going to step away from this and become something less than. Quite the opposite. Verse 7, rather he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself the same way God did to the Israelites. However, with the twist, the being that is taking on this mentality, that is taking on this humility, is the same being that was exposing a nation and a number of people to, to experiences to bring them to the same mindset. So here he is actually putting his money where his mouth is, becoming what he was trying to get these other individuals to become, exposing them in the same way. Many times people think, if I was around when Christ was around, I'd have so many questions. And we would undoubtedly pull him to the side and be like, listen, what's going on with this? And you'd be able to ask whatever questions you had. Why am I having all of these problems? Why are things working out this way? Um, was God not paying attention? Did was like, like call him and the phone was on vibrate? Does, does he have moments where he kind of steps away? Did he go to the bathroom? What happened? What's going on? And you would hope to get some enlightenment. But when we look at the Bible, when we look at how Christ is talking, if you recognize that the same being that we saw in the Old Testament is the same individual with the same way of thinking and the same rationale in the New Testament, you, you, you could kind of fill in the blanks. Many times we find people looking for answers to prayer that just seems like they're not coming. And there was a point in time where that question was put to Christ, what was going on? And Christ advised them to pray without ceasing. And he would give parables that would show, don't stop. And recognize who was saying that, who's telling you don't stop praying, the one that people were praying to, even at work. People will call me and they need certain services. They need certain things done. They need me to perform certain things for them. And I'll tell them, you call me. You can leave a message. You can email me. If I don't pick up, well, then call me back. But keep calling. Don't stop. Because that, that persistence is going to make me do it. And I'm not God. I'm a dude wait until 4.30 when I'm supposed to get off, hoping to sneak out at 12 if nobody's looking. And God has a completely different attitude. God actually cares, which is the point Christ was trying to make. So he was like, don't stop. Again, advice coming with like an insider tip. He, behind the scenes, knows how things work, and he's telling you the answers to the test. And so here again, he took on the very attitudes and mentality that he was fashioning in other people when he served as that God being. And that's the journey we're on. Even now, we're on a journey. It can be difficult. Y'all up in here, shivering. <laughs> people are I stepped away for those on, on camera to turn off the air conditioner 
because everybody in the room was getting all cold. So, I mean, I was enjoying my life <laughs> because I, I, was, I was hot. But my point is the others were uncomfortable and we were on different journeys. And so I turned off the air conditioner. And so we're going to find that our journey is supposed to emulate the journey that Christ was on, the same journey that he took when he left the world that he was living in. That was a journey to separate yourself from that. And just like the Israelites, just like Abraham, go somewhere that's unfamiliar to you. Go somewhere where you're going to be exposed to elements that you are not accustomed to. And that's exactly what God did when he became a man. That's exactly what happened to Abram when he left wherever he was. That's what happened to the Israelites when they left Egypt. And that's what's happening to us on the journey that we're on. So, yeah, we're fresh off the heels of coming from the feast. And that was a journey, getting there and getting back. But there's a bigger journey that we need to recognize that we're on every day. And it's kind of a lull when you get back from that feast journey, because it's like, all right, now what? When you're going through the year, there are all of these checkpoints of holy days to recognize. But when you get to the fall, going into the winter, it's dead. The world, they have their, their holidays. But we need to remember the journey that we're on during this period. And, and, and to my surprise, during the feast, that, that's what, second, third week of October? Yep. I saw a Christmas commercial on TV. <laughs> Old Navy is playing a Christmas commercial in October. Yeah. Already? And so they're ready to start their journey. They're ready to, to remind people about activities that really won't bring them closer to God the way that the activities that we're following are. But again, we're on different journeys. Yep. But we are supposed to emulate Christ. Hebrews 5 and verse 7. During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with fervent cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. So Christ's life wasn't easy either. And you would think, being the Son of God, you would have just an easy ride. But remember, he's living a life that's an example to us. He's going through all the same stuff that we would have to go through. He came out of Egypt, literally, just like we have to come out of Egypt. He went and got baptized to repent of his sins just the way we do, even though he never sinned. He too didn't want to go through certain experiences. And he made that known. And God the Father was able to give him the, the stamina to do the things that he had to do to achieve the purposes that he had to achieve. Yes, Son though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered. And once made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. Amen. He's God's son, just like Israel, just like us. And he had the same problems. In other words, he did not get special treatment because he was God's son. But what he, that example did show was there was a way to relate to God. And that's what we have to do. And many times we think we're supposed to get special treatment because we don't eat pork. Our life is supposed to go way easier. <laughs> because we don't celebrate Christmas, our life is supposed to go way easier than the guy next to us. Because we will eat unleavened bread in the spring. We shouldn't have any problems. And yet, God's son himself got all these issues and things going on. And you would think, how can this be? But that's normal life. Problems, they're there the same way they were there for Israel, for us to learn from and navigate through. It's an obstacle course. And we have to work our way around it. There's a highway here 
in New York called the Long Island Expressway. That Long Island Expressway, it's true to its name, it is long. And it is monotonous. Yes, there is no, nothing really on the side to gauge your interest. And after 10 minutes on driving on that, you're going to be so sleepy. There's nothing to see. There's nothing to get your interest. The ride will kill you, literally. You'll get in an accident. These obstacles are here to keep us awake, to keep us paying attention, to help us grow. Without obstacles, life doesn't get any better. Life doesn't change. You see these kids and they have these little letdowns, and I shouldn't say that. They're not little letdowns. But when you live 50 plus years, they're little letdowns. Because you've seen bigger, you've seen harder. So some boy don't like you. Some girl doesn't find you appealing. What do some kids do? They take their life. Because that first impression of pain, oh, it's, it's too much. Little do they know, it gets worse. So if you were to tell a child that as a grief counselor, yeah, um, I know things didn't work out the way you wanted. You wanted her to like you. She likes somebody else. And I know it hurts. But it's going to get far worse than that. <laughs> That's not going to go over well. But it's true. Yeah. And when it does get far worse than that, 40, 50 years later, you look at that and you look back and like, that was nothing. Right? You know the expression, I've been kicked out of way better places. Mm -hmm. We've all been kicked out of way better places at this point in time. All because of problems. The problems that you would have avoided if you could would have made you weaker now at 50 or 40 years old, 60 years old. Problems that don't even resonate anymore when you look back. It just doesn't. And Paul tells us the same thing, even though we can't see it now in the future, when we become whatever it is we're going to become, and whatever that is, we can't see it, and it is not apparent now, but whatever we do become, we're going to look just like God, just like Christ. And when you look back, these problems that seem so great are going to be corny in the same way. So shout out to problems. <laughs> They're actually needed. Your body will not adjust to disease unless it's exposed to sickness. Unless your body is given the chance to beat it, 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 it won't develop immunity. And when you do develop that immunity, oh, it will kick your butt. You will succumb to it initially. But when you build up the antibody, you're okay. Afterwards, going forward. And so, Problems are necessary. And Christ showed us that. And he showed the relationship that we are supposed to preserve with God and being exposed to them. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 14. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. Amen. This book of Hebrews is beginning to make the point that this leadership religious position that Christ is now serving, that in their culture, the Jews were exposed to growing up and in their history, having a high priest. It was a position that required some degree of compassion that Christ has developed from living life as a human being, just like we have. But we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Yes, sir. Amen. And so we're supposed to pursue the same journey that Christ pursued, the same journey in trying to find God, the same journey in trying to connect with God, and the same journey 
that the Israelites pursued, the same journey that Abraham pursued. Galatians chapter 3, verse 26. So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. We're all children by the way that we live, by the way that we think, by utilizing God's spirit. For having gone through that process of baptism, just like Christ did, even though he didn't sin, and we return away from our sins and come out of Egypt, and we've clothed ourselves with Christ, meaning it's obvious who we're down with, who we're connected to, by the way we dress, by the way we act. You could tell someone's a Yankee fan because they're wearing a Yankee cap. You could tell people are from certain backgrounds or countries sometimes by the way they dress. Some people, they don't wear socks with dress shoes. You may not see too many Americans doing it. And it's like, all right, I see where you're from. Some people dress in a certain way that may signify they, they have certain interests or persuasions in life. Some people dress tomboyish and so forth. You could tell a lot about a person by the way they dress. Girl walking around with Timberland boots and you know, clothes that maybe you might see a guy wearing. You get it. You, you, you could look at people and see how they're dressing. Oh, you work in construction from the way that they're dressed. I remember once I was in the city with a friend and I had some snacks and I, and I wanted to bust these snacks down. So I was like, you know what? Let's just sit down on here on the curb and, and open up these snacks. There's no shame. When you're young, you get away with that. So we sat down and we start to eat. Somebody walked by and, and put a dollar in, in my hat that I had taken off and put on the ground while I was eating. I was like, what are you trying to say? It's like, do I look that bad? So I guess it's all in how you dress, all in how you're perceived. Here, the author is saying, you're going to be clothe yourself with Christ. You're going to look like that's what you were part of, by the, the symbolism of what you're wearing, how you're acting, how you're thinking, how you're dressed spiritually, how you're dressed mentally. That's what's most important. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed. And here's according to the promise. The promise that was given to Abraham that we started this presentation off with. It didn't look like he was talking about brothers. It didn't look like he was talking about Caribbeans or Latinos. It didn't look like he was talking about Americans. It didn't look like he was talking about Canadians. But he was, because we're all Abraham's seed. And the writer is saying there's no Jew, there's no Gentile. There's no slave, there's no free. There's no Caribbean in this. We're all in God's family. There's no Jamaican. There is no Yardie. There is no root boy. There is no Latino. There is no Latina. There is no Morena. There is no Bonitua. There is just people of God. So many times we make up these differences in who we are, and we leave that one out. We shout out where we're from. We shout out whatever neighborhood we come from. But it's a new neighborhood now, new journey. You don't see Abraham shouting out his hometown. He didn't because his eyes were on another kingdom that hadn't made itself apparent yet. So leave Kingston behind. And look forward to the kingdom. So we are Abraham's descendants, and we're all on that journey. Micah 4, verse 5. (laughs) 
All the nations may walk in the name of their gods, but we will walk in the name of the Lord our God forever and ever. Many times the Bible expresses the way we live with how we walk. Who you walk with, it determines what you're about as well. If you walk with God, then you're going to think and act the way God does. If you're going to keep that kind of company, then you must share the same mindset. And all, all of this is a part of emulating God and copying God, keeping the same mindset that he kept and behaving the way he behaved. Romans 8, chapter 14. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you receive brought about your adoption to sonship. Here Paul is equating being adopted by God with the adoption process in his world, in his culture, in his time. In his time, when you were adopted, you lost all the rights to your former family, and you gained the rights to your new family. If you had debt with your former family under your former family's name, when you got adopted by the new family, your debt was wiped clean. You started new. He's comparing adoption by God to adoption in the Roman Greco world that he was in. And that's what he's saying to us. We've been adopted by God. We're children of God. And because of that, we got a new start. And our former debts have been wiped away. And this is the process that we are supposed to be pursuing. This is the journey we're supposed to be on. Matthew 7 shows that this journey isn't popular, and not a lot of people are on this journey. Enter through the narrow gate, verse 13, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. Everybody's going to go the way that seems to be most common, but the way that's not traveled by as much, that's the way that God is exposing to us. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it by special invitation. Only a few find it when they're called by God. John chapter 10 shows this gate again. It's not the broad gate. And it's the narrow gate that we're going on. Here Christ is talking to the Pharisees and religious leaders. They weren't going through the proper gates either. They were trying to steal attention from God, redirect people's attention from God to themselves. Verse 1, chapter 10 of John, Very truly I tell you, Pharisees, anyone who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate but climbs in by some other way is a thief and a robber. If you're not walking in through the front door, then maybe you don't belong here. If any of you have pets, a dog, or even a cat that's social, those animals sit by the door, and they stare at the door, and they wait for you to come home because they're expecting you to come through the door. They're expecting you as their owner. They're not looking through any other means of entrance. And this is what Christ is saying. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. So you look at these sheep pens back in the day, and it's some sort of enclosed, in, in sort of enclo some sort of enclosure to hold the sheep in. It may be stone, it may be a bunch of uh, bushes and such, but it's going to be an enclosure that's going to have a small gate, big enough for a sheep to go through. And the shepherd would go through that gate as well to encounter the sheep. Now, if you wanted to steal a nice plumpy sh sheep for a snack and you weren't going to go to the market and you wanted to steal it from your neighbor, you can't go through the gate, or you wouldn't. It's too much trouble. You're not going to stoop down and crawl through. You're going to try to hop over, snatch you up a sheep. Christ is saying, someone that resonates, that recognizes and interacts with these sheep, they're going through the front, and that's what the sheep are expecting. The point being, you're going through the narrow gate, that's the way to go. You're going through this narrow gate, looking for your owner, looking for God. There's only one way. There is no other way to find God. There is no other way to embark on this journey but this. The world has its own journey, its own way of doing things. It doesn't work. It won't work. And so the gods of this world can't save you. 
the medicines of this world ultimately will not be able to save you. All the Christmases, all the Santa Clauses, all the filth and foreign filth, all the libertine ways of living, all the fornication, I'm not going to save you. You can remix the song as many times as you want. It doesn't change. There is only one way, and that's the way in pursuing God. There is no other way to do this. 2 Corinthians, an ending in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. Do not be yoked together with unbelievers. Many times people use this on their mates. You, you don't want to hook up with someone that's not doing the same thing that you're doing, you know? Someone that doesn't act the way you act, think the way you think. Believe what you believe. And that's how these verses are often used, on your mate. I'm not using it on your mate. I'm using it on your God. Do not be yoked together with unbelievers. But what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? Why God want to hang with you? What interest does he have in you if you're not going to live right? And what interest do you have in God if you're not going to live right? You're going to have the same mind that Christ had and behave the same way that Christ did and the way he related to God. You're going to respond in a positive way when you embark on this journey, the way the Israelites did. They went out proud with high hand, mind you. They had the, uh, you probably won't even get this reference, but they had the Richard Pryor walk as they walked out of Egypt. Their hand was up. Yeah, we bad. Most of the room will not understand what I'm talking about. But not Richard Pryor, Gene Wilder, notwithstanding. They were proud when they walked out of Egypt. They had a certain attitude. Abram was told, get up and leave. And he left. He was told they had to go, and he went back inside his house, and he said to Sarah, baby, we got to go. She said, where are we going? What you doing? And they just pack up, let's go. And they left. When Christ was told to move, he moved. Whether it was Joseph taking him to Egypt, whether it was the Spirit leading him to the mountain, whatever journey he was led on, he did it. Yep. So we, too, on our journey, we need to be responsive to God and have the same mindset. But what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? It doesn't work. One drenches out the other. So we too must be light the same way God is light. We must relate to God in the same way, in the same manner. What harmony is there between Christ and any other God? And so the same question can be said of us. What do we have in common with God if we're not going to live right? What agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? For we are the temple of the living God. God's spirit lives in you, in the way that you think. It alters the way that you think. This spirit within you is the temple. The, the Jews of, the, of, of Paul's day, towards the end of his life, had to contend with the fact that there was no temple. Now what? It's not about the literal journey. It's not about the literal place. It's about using God's spirit. Amen. The Jews of this day had to contend in, in, in the later part of the first century with the fact that the temple fell. Yeah. All this fussing over getting circumcised or not, all this fussing over eating food offered to idols or not, and now the temple falls, now what? Now what? There's, it seemed like the whole religion just collapsed. There's nothing to celebrate anymore without a cake, right? This is what the writer is saying. What matters is the way that we think using God's spirit, the way that we live in studying and praying and maintaining a relationship with God and enduring through the troubles of life that come to shape us and then repeating that process. That's the walk that we live. 
walking with God, sharing the same way that he thinks. I will live with them. Paul is quoting from scripture. I will live with them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. Amen. Therefore, come out from them and be separate. Paul is quoting a number of different scriptures. Touch no unclean thing, and I will receive you. And he concludes with another scripture. I will be a father to you, and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. And we are God's children, and so we are to emulate this. Therefore, since we have these promises, dear friends, let us purify ourselves from everything that contaminates body and spirit, perfecting holiness out of reverence for God. This is what we are supposed to be doing. This is the journey that we're on. This is the walk that we're living. And this is the walking journey that we continue to pursue, even though we've come home from the feast. So many of us came home tired. I came home tired. And I'm like, man, I'm going to rest. I'm going to rest so hard. And then I had to send out the notice of who was speaking. And I was like, all right, poor soul that has to speak. He's not going to get to rest. <laughs> and then I looked up who was speaking, and I saw it was me. I was like, oh, man. And, and so my journey didn't stop. And I had to throw something together. But I was tired. And we can get tired on this journey. And especially now at the end of the feast, it's like, now what are we celebrating? The journey. The fact that they were able to even have this journey to participate in. And that's worth celebrating. 